Okay, I think we are live now, which means we just need James in here so we can start talking about gladiators. That is the topic of today. So let's let's get Mr. Ria. There we go. Hi. Hi from Petra and hi back to you from the UK. Hope you're doing well, my friend. And James is just here too. I just accepted your invite, so I don't know why it's not working. Okay, second chance, maybe? Just Instagram being a bit temperamental. Is it letting you in, James? Hey, having some technical problems. Come on, why don't you just let him into the chat? Okay. Okay, well, James is just going to come back on. Apologies for this. Yes, uh, gladiators is the topic of today, if Instagram will let us do it. And I think James is joining again. So hopefully. Uh -huh. And there we go. Yeah. Took a moment or two. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know what was going on there. That's right, no worries. Okay, cool. Well, we are ready. And, well, cool. as long as you are ready, then we can get started. Yeah, yeah, no, we're good. And yes, James is indeed the gladiator. So the cat is kind of out of the bag. Um, but I will do a very brief introduction for those of you who have just joined us or for those of you who are watching this at home. Welcome to the second episode of HIST Club, which is a series of talks with historians and archaeologists about different topics in history. I am Lily. I am the uh, CEO here at Travolution Tours. Uh, we are a tour guiding company and an educational company on history side of things. And today, our very special guest is James here. Um, you may know him because he's done some reenactment stuff with us previously. But James is a historian of his own right. He doesn't just go around winging swords. And... Um, He's going to be telling us today about gladiators, why do gladiators become such a phenomena in Rome and beyond, and any questions that you may have on the subject. So I will let James introduce himself first. Hello, yeah, so um, I'm James. Um, I am a Roman reenactor, first and, first and foremost. Um, I'm part of a, uh, a British group called Leg to, uh, well, Second Legion of Augustus or Legio Secunda Augusta, uh, based down in Portsmouth in the UK. Um, we are a living history society more than a reenactment group, so we try and portray um, what life possibly was like during the first century AD to second century AD um, in, so basically in Roman times, military, civilian, what it might be like to be a slave, but also uh, the life of gladiators as well. So I do military, but a large part of what I do is gladiators. Um, I've been doing it for, uh, it's coming on for 12 years now. I started in 2010, 2011. Um, so I've been doing it definitely for over, over a decade. Um, I've got the, the scars and the joint pains to prove it um but it, it's a very it's a very fascinating area and it's because it's, it's probably one of the largest areas of myth busting that you get in, in when when you're looking at Rome period and romans um and it's a, it's it's most because we probably see gladiators normally as this kind of just barbaric blood sport um that everyone kind of just 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 abhors in in modern times but 
it, it, it's so much more, it, it's so much deeper than that. Um, and it's always interesting talking about it to, to, the, to the general public and well, basically busting those, those myths and actually showing a bit of, a, of a, um, an uncomfortable comparison between basically us and us and them. There's always a, it's always a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic to be discussing with people. But yeah, that, that's, that's uh, me. That's um, not the game's that's not. Yeah, and yeah, and it's not. It's not just. I, I I look a lot of the academic side of it. Um, it was actually the topic of my PhD, looking at gladiators in popular culture. Uh, but also, it's just really fun to hit people with swords. So it's 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 best of both worlds. We just have a really quick comment from Preta Pro um, tour guide. Um, he's actually one of my tour guide friends. So if you're ever in Jordan and you want a super cool tour of Petra go to this guy, he's the best. Uh, but yeah, he's just saying in Jarash, a, German, a Roman city in, in Jordan, there was um, a few years ago, a gladiator show. And this is actually something that is becoming really popular, right? Because um, one of the things that James actually does is he goes with his group to places where they do recreate actual fights. So just to start with, can you sort of run us through what people may be used to being a gladiator fight and then maybe explain us that's what we see in popular culture but how it would have actually been in roman times yeah yeah sure so well the it, it's, it's probably the best thing to start off with is if you get someone who says this is exactly how a gladiator fight would have happened they're talking out their ass because we honestly don't know the truth um we, we we're not in. It, you, no one can say for certain that games, that all games, happened in this order. Um, I like to get this out there now because, as anyone who, who's looked at the ancient world knows, uh, it, it's it's just a puzzle with like ninety percent of the pieces missing. Normally, most of the time, so it, it we don't know for certain how gladiator fights happen. Um, but so, yeah, as, as I said, if anyone kind of said, oh, this is how it definitely happened, they're, 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 they are just, uh, just outright naturally wrong. Um, but generally the, the image that normally gets portrayed in movies, um, and cinema and things like Gladiator, and, and the Spartacus series, so I'll come on to that in a little bit, is normally two guys or maybe a, a bunch of people in a sandy pit, uh, just hacking and slashing at each other and basically just decapitating one another and, and, and lots of blood, lots of killing and, and just lots of, lots of death. Basically just, just kind of just, it, it's no, it has been, um, put down as like ritualized slaughter and just entertaining and, uh, slaughter for entertainment. And that's how popular culture normally portrays it as, um, and that that that's been and 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 that's kind of come from the fact that it's more gruesome that way. It it goes with the whole barbaric uh, appeal. Also in academia as well. It's only been recently in the last few years that people have actually started looking at gladiators, looking at the games as being more than just kind of brutal combat. So um, if, if you go back kind of a, a, a few years back in like the even just like the nineties there was one guy called Podiakot and he basically didn't even class it as a sport. He said sports had to have a set of rules. They had to have a set of conditions. He said gladiator fighting wasn't even a sport. It was just pure basic murder for entertainment purposes, which is fine. But we're looking at reanalyzing evidence, reconsidering things and just looking closer into little fragments, it seems that actually there were rules, there were set conditions. And I 100% I argue that it was a sport because we have this kind of evidence for these, as, as, as vague as it can be, these, these rules of what you can and can't do. So for instance, you have something at the beginning of a fight called the armatura, which is basically the inspection of the, of the uh, weapons in the armor. And there's one, uh, fragmentary case of a gladiator who went out in the wrong kit. He got an absolute bollocking. He had to go back 
get the right stuff on and come back out again. Um, so there was this full on inspection. Um, there was what we can tell the, 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 the most, um, the most modern comparison is, is basically a referee in the fights called a semi Rudis. Um, he's, he's depicted quite a lot in mosaic gladiator fights and wall release. He's normally a guy with a tunic with like, maybe like a, a red clawy down, down, down the sides of his tunic. Um, he's normally seen with a stick as well. Again, we're not, can't say 100% or for certain what his main role was, but it seems that he had uh, definitely presence and control over the gladiators. So maybe he was more like a referee, but that's someone who hardly, I've never, I've never seen them depicted at all in, um, in, in, in movies or TV series or even in documentaries about gladiators. It's kind of this, this forgotten figure. Um, and even in the fighters themselves as well, we have evidence that there was this kind of unwritten rule that you looked after yourselves, you looked after each other in the fight. And we do have evidence, again, fragmentary and, and, and it's not in massive abundance, but we have evidence that actually some fights, maybe the majority of them were maybe choreographed and certainly not all the fights were to the death. In fact, it seems that a rare, that a rare number of them were actually to the death. Uh, a fine example of it is in Pompeii, uh, there is a graffiti advertisement for the gladiator fight, and it specifically say, states, to the death. Now, Roman writing at the time, there was a big assumption that you already know the context of it. Again, they're not writing for us to have read it in 2000 years, and they think, oh, I better, uh, there's going to be some nerd looking at this in 2000 years, I better make sure they know that this is to the death. It's going to be for the common audience. So if you are specifically advertising to the death, it generally presumes that that's not an not ordinary fun. thing. That, that's a new, exciting thing. It's kind of like in, again, I, I do like to compare wrestling, modern day uh, 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 professional wrestling with gladiators. And the, the idea of like, you get these special matches like head in a cell or table laddered and chairs or like I quit matches, like a proper group kind of things that, that will grab the audience in and this kind of like to the death state is definitely is definitely one way of doing that cool. so there are there are um the the, the base base the, the kind of main differences between the real life well what we know as be like the, the real life fights and what we see in popular culture is that actually popular culture uh very much exaggerates the brutality and the violence of and actually, this all ties in with a question that we have on the chat, which is about the, well, the actual nature of where do these gladiators came from? So uh, Petra Progai just asked, gladiators, were they champions or prisoners that became fighters? And I know there is actually a lot of research that has been done about this, and I know this is something that you're particularly interested in. So could you tell us a bit more about who these people were? Like, why did they end up in the arena, yeah. where they came from? Yeah, well, it it, it, it kind of goes... The supply of prisoners, um, and we normally think of prisoners of war at this point, so just captured enemy fighters. Um, the, the big kind of supply and demand generally seems to have the trend with, with whether Rome is expanding or not. So during the um, kind of the second century BC and in the first century BC, when Rome is, is expanding quite a lot, and you, you, you've got the kind of expansion into the east, but then you've also got the expansion in, into, into Gaul, um, there seems to be, it, it's quite, pop, it's quite it, it, it would be quite likely that a lot of these gladiators would be prisoners of war. Um, however, it's not always, that's not always the case. And in fact, it could be that these could be slaves that have been sold to Eludus as well. So if you've got some troublesome slave, but you kind of, um, and again, there were the, it, it, just not to go on a tangent, but there were strict laws about what you could and couldn't do with slaves and how you were viewed in it as well. So Cato the Elder, for instance, he was he was uh, known to sell his slaves when they were old and basically useless. And actually, he's kind of condemned for it. The idea is you don't actually you, you, if you had a slave who's, who's, who's showed you a life of, of loyalty, you don't just go and sell them because they're old. It, it was actually quite condemned. So it, again, it, it's, it's different views. It provides different insights into slavery at the time as well, but, but um, I do digress. Um, you have um, 
uh, uh, what was it? Where was I going with it? Um, where the slaves were coming from when Rome was. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, where the slaves are coming from. So, uh, it could be slaves that have been sold to the looters, or it could also be uh, criminals who have been um, uh, sentenced to either die in the arena or actually become a gladiator. There were two different punishments. Uh, one was called um, uh, damnatio ad gladium um, or damnatio ad bestium or even uh, damnatio ad ludum. So the idea is that either basically uh, ad bestium means you'll be killed by animals in the arena. Uh, gladium might mean that either you get killed by gladiators or actually might end up being, having a chance of becoming one or ad ludum means you'll just get sold to a ludus. And basically, it, it is kind of a. It can be a bit of a death sentence in it, in it, in its in its own sense because um, life was very very hard. You have the constant. You do have the risk of, of getting well, very seriously injured or even killed in in the arena, and you lose your citizen rights as well. So if you are a citizen who's being condemned to uh, ad gladium and ad ludum, you 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 basically are no longer a citizen, and you're you're treated uh, you, you you're lower than than rubbish basically. Uh, but also, you could voluntarily become a gladiator right. as well. And this is the interesting part. Well, these are called the Octorium tests. I, I wanted to ask about that because we have another question which asks, why, what was the reason that these gladiators were fighting for? And if, if they were fighting for their freedom or, or what for? But obviously, if, if you are volunteering to become a gladiator, then your the reason why you're fighting i take it is completely different it's not necessarily because you want to earn a certain status or or is it related so it could be it could be quite it could be related um rome's normally seen as kind of like this big welfare state for some reason but it's, it's, <laughs> it's very much the opposite uh rome doesn't really give a crap about the citizens too much and if you are really hard on life, you've got no job, you're basically almost living in the street. If you sell yourself to a ludus, then you will get um, uh, regular uh, regular meals right. uh, and, and, and good meals at that. Uh, you will be trained, basically. You will have a roof over your head. If you do well, uh, you, will, you will be able to, if you, if you win fights, and you make and you earn money for the for the ludus your gladiator school uh you will take a portion of that you will have your savings what's called a piculum um and you could use that to eventually potentially buy your freedom uh or even get perks as well so if you become quite a good gladiator and and, and the ludus knows your worth uh you'll get perks um if you have a family when you join the ludus they could move in with you um you could have women you could have well really nice wine and and parties and stuff you you know you, you, you there was a sense of uh you could get financial reward from it like i said you could get this money that eventually could buy you could either win or, or uh or you could either like earn or or buy your freedom back uh if you were sentenced to it as like a slave or a criminal then effectively you didn't really have a choice whether you joined or not. So potentially most of the time you were either trying to make your life as good as you could in the circumstances or maybe try and with, with the overall aim of trying to get out of it at some point um, and become maybe like a freed man um, or an or, or, or stylist. Um, but there was also, it's it, gladiator, again, gladiators are weird in that they are legally they are the, the lowest of the, of the low. They're kind of almost even lower than the slaves, technically, in, in, in some ways. But they are incredibly popular. They, there, is a, there is normally a comparison of, of gladiators having the same kind of like uh, uh, social profile or popularity profiles, like what they sports here, they talk about things like football and whatnot. And actually, that, yeah, that does, seem, that does seem the case. Uh, in the fact that um, fight editors uh, will actually kind of hire retired famous gladiators to almost kind of like spotlight or be like the main event in some right. show. So these guys had a lot of fame. So even like if you wanted to just uh, become, just try and become rich and famous, basically, doing it in becoming a gladiator in that sense um, 
is is not a bad not a bad way um and and there's another element in it and this is where kind of like part of the newest research tend to be is tend to looking at the moment and it's looking at women ear spiders as well now we often get the term gladiatrix yeah um the, the the term gladiatrix is a modern term uh there's no latin source well there's, there's no original source that 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 um uh that that specifically states the term gladiatrix but we do know women fought in the arena in fact they were so popular at one point that a law came out under hadrian that stated uh that um uh women of wealth cannot fight in the arena they're banned to because it was something you didn't want to you didn't want to do um so there's no arguments about are these people kind of the the ancient form of, of feministic fighters right in a way they're, they're rebelling against the norm uh but if you also think about it if, you, if you're stuck if you're a woman at the time you're kind of mostly housebound you're stuck with the same kind of day-to-day -day routine if you get the option of going into arena uh swinging a sword about and and, and having some proper excitement all right <laughs> i can see the appeal in that i mean you know I, I mean, yeah, whatever, whatever floats your try room yeah. yeah um <coughs> but yeah it, it could basically whoever people joining the gladiators could be it could be a mixture of trying to get some financial uh reward maybe some fame but also just a fact of like i said you, you will get regular food you will get uh training you'd probably become healthier than you'd ever be and you'd have a roof over your head with the chance of, of extra perks in life that you wouldn't that, that you yeah. probably have no chance of getting if you, if you weren't gladiator. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And I think that really helps us sort of understand how gladiators, you know, how how sometimes the, the reality that we see on the TV or, or other media may be warped. But I think, you know, one of the things that most people know about gladiators, and I was hoping we could talk about, and in fact, we have a question about this, is like the different types of gladiators, right? Because they, are, they were not all the same. It depends on the equipment that they were using. And actually, one of the questions we have on the chat is, what was the gladiator's famous weapon? Like, was there, was there any in particular that were more famous than others? Was there any particular type of gladiator that was more famous or popular? And um, did that have anything to do with their weapons or their fighting style? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, the so the, the, hmm, the most famous weapon. So yeah, there were, there were loads of different types of gladiators. Um, the, the, the name gladiator, effectively, it means kind of swordsman. So the, the Latin term for a generic sword is uh, gladius. So gladius, gladiator, it basically means like a swordman. Um, and yes, for the most part, particularly early style gladiators, uh, or, or the gladiators in the early days, they did mostly fight with swords. The weapons do start changing as a mixture of, it, it, it's a mixture of new enemies that Rome faced and defeated, and entertainment value as well so for instance if we take the the samnite gladiator which is quite common during the uh, second century bc going into the first century uh the samnites at that point were kind of still a a a, a recent enemy and in fact the samnites do feature as a um, as a as a as a kind of cultural faction during the social war in the early first century BC, uh, so they, they they stay quite relevant. When you get into the first century AD, uh, the late and the late first century BC and going into like the first century AD, the Samnites aren't really kind of uh, 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 an opponent of Rome, um, or they're not really seen as 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 they're just part of Italy now. Right. And so trying to trying to have what would be a Samnite gladiator or, or basically a gladiator and kit it out to look like a Samnite, probably a lot of the newer generations not really going to know what they're going to look like, not really know what they look like. So you change them up. So with the Samnite gladiator um, and, and kind of like the Gallic gladiator, they, they kind of transform into newer versions, more kind of entertainment style versions. So the the... The original types seem to be that they were the they were the types that 
they were representing enemies of enemies that Rome had fought and defeated. So things like the Samnite gladiator, but then you've also got the Hoplomachus, which was a, a take on the Macedonian um, phalanx troops. You've got the Thrakes, so Thracian. Um, these were opponents that Rome had fought and Rome had beaten, and basically it's, it's almost a kind of like a, a military museum kind of in, yeah. in, in this sense. Um, and that's all fine, but then people are would kind of eventually get bored and see the same thing, so Rome needed to uh, mix it up a bit. So in the what seems to be about 20 BC or so, we see this attempt at a fighter with a net and a trident. Uh, and it, it's the kind of proto- uh, it's also the, the kind of proto retiarius of the time. Um, now, for a long while, people were wondering, oh, let's take off the fisherman. And, and retiarius basically just means net man. Net. Um, and it was a take on a fisherman. But actually, even the retiarius seems to have had some military, uh, some, some military influence from one of Alexander's um, conquests, um, Alexander the Great's conquests. Um, so, but, uh, so basically the weapons start varying. So whereas before the sword was becoming quite common, what well, was the most common or basically the most primary type, now you're seeing different kinds of weapons. Now you're seeing tridents and nets, you're now seeing spears. Uh, you also got sagittari, which are basically archers in the arena. Um, you have esidari, yeah, you have, a, you have esidari as well, which are uh, chariot fighters. Um, you have this really weird looking weapon, which is kind of like a, it look, it's like a crescent blade. It's basically a, a big, uh, you, you, I'm trying to, how do I describe it? It's like a kind of gauntlet that you put your hand in and there's a bar and you grip the, you grip the bar and it's connected to this crescent shaped blade called an abel. Okay. Um, now we, we're not too sure on the types of, proper types of gladiators that used it, but it seems to be a, a form of second that used it, or maybe um, uh, called, called, or a gladiator called the Arbelas. They, so they're, they're kind of, again, the origin of that weapon, that's in, that's in debate. You're seeing quite different forms of, of weaponry now. So it still relates in part to Rome's history, and it's kind of, in a way, a bit of a free history lesson for people. Right. But also, it, it, it's mixing up the combatants and, and mixing up what you see to keep it a bit more fresh and and entertaining. Um, in terms of the most famous uh, most famous weapon, it's, it's probably actually maybe the trident and the net. So the retiari is, I mean, if you go to Google and type in gladiator, uh, nine times out of ten, the first few images that come up is going to be of the, of the guy holding a, a trident and a net. Um, so I'd, I'd say either the traditional sword or, or the trident would be the most famous kind of weapons. Uh, but yeah, there were there were loads, there were several different types, or there were loads of different types of, of, of gladiators. Um, they seem to be the same types no matter where you go in the empire. Right. So it's not like you could have a set different versions. Italy would have different versions of everything else, and this might come down to how universal, universally, the games were were regulated. Um, and it seems that they, if they were the same types, then it's, it's likely they had to wear the same form of equipment and, and whatnot. But yeah, they were, they were, they were, um, uh, it wasn't just a case of just a guy with a sword and shield attacking another guy with a sword and shield. In fact, it was very rare to see two opponents kitted out exactly the same because you haven't got that variety. Yeah. You, 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 you gladiators are often split even from, um, the Roman sources are split between maybe uh, what's normally first to like a light and heavy mm -hmm. or small and large shield as well. So you might have the, uh, the pamillari or the, set of the uh, scutari. So the, the scutari are the larger shields who are normally the heavier guys and the pamillari are normally the smaller shields and the lighter guys. Um, they would normally face off each other because you've got two opposites. You've got kind of a David and Goliath. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, strong and strong and big versus fast and agile kind of kind of dynamic. Basically, kind of when you stick like again for, for like wrestling powers, basically when you stick like Rey Mysterio in the ring against the Undertaker, that kind of that kind of dynamic. That's fair. Yeah.
And um, just because I'm becoming aware of the time, we have about 15 minutes to go on this. But one of the things that we sort of said that we wanted to do with, with this talk was sort of doing a bit of myth busting. So could you maybe pick apart a little bit the film Gladiator to sort of show people, you know, yeah. this may look very, very <laughs> fun on TV, but actually these are some very sort of clear uh, trends that they've set up that a lot of people sort of think this is how gladiators wear that are actually very far removed from the reality. Yeah. Is, there, is there any particular either kit or person that people would be familiar from that film that would simply not uh, have existed uh, in Roman society or would have been very, very different? Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. So hey, I'm gonna need more than 15 for this one. <laughs> uh, well, but, try and condense it. <laughs> yeah, um, let's say, so f first of all, let, let's go with the weaponry. Let's, let's stick with the weaponry. So. I love the film. I do. I love the film Gladiator. Um, I honestly do. It's up, it's up there as one of my favourites. Um, but the weaponry, and, and this is very much in line with, with popular culture at the moment as well, is it 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 it, it, it incorporates uh, a philosophy of neo medievalism into it. I'm not going to go too much into into depth in this, but basically. When you think of barbaric weaponry, you will often think of medieval weapons, things like flails and maces and just great big axes and war hammers and things like this. The most brutal kind of just absolute like, barbaric, badass weaponry comes from medieval parts. Now, when you're trying to portray the gladiator games, and that's what the gladiator is trying to do, it's trying to show the brutal side of gladiator combat. One of the ways that you, one of the ways of, of, of trying to make something as brutal as possible is give it the most brutal weapons. So what you get, and you get this in, in all the films and all the uh, and, and all the TV and all the TV series and again in, in documentaries as well, is this incorporation of medieval style weaponry into Roman gladiators. So for instance, um, it, it's a fantastic scene in the movie where they're they're waiting. I think they're in Libya. And they're or in, in Tunisia, maybe, and they're waiting to go into the arena for that first time. You've got them all waiting in that corridor, and one guy pees himself. Uh, and I love that. I love that scene completely. But then, you, then as soon as they run out, one of them just gets smashed in the face with a with a mace, with a flail, kind of kind of weapon. Um, so the, the weaponry themselves, they didn't have any of that. Um, they had again, like I said, they had they had uh, swords. And spears were probably the most common types that you'd see in the in the fighting. Maybe the maybe the trident with the net for the retiari. Maybe Sagittari had some bows and whatnot. But it wouldn't have been they they wouldn't have been able to jump forward three hundred years to grab some mace and come back again. Um, axes are interesting, and it's something I'm looking at at the moment in terms of how if, how much axes were actually kind of incorporated into ancient culture. Right. But specifically for gladiator games, they weren't, again, they weren't, they they weren't things. No. So it's a complete kind of, again, it's a complete incorporation of the most brutal weapon you can imagine. Mix it in with one of the most brutal kind of enter historical entertainment factors. And it, it, in terms of like getting your point across on how brutal and violent gladiator games were, it's, a, it's just a complete, it's just a perfect match. Uh, the second kind of myth is probably... Um, see, it does it does things really well, but it's probably the second thing is that um, I'll, I'll do I'll do two quickly. So first one, first one's not just the weapons, but also the the armor or what they're wearing. Mm -hmm. So you've got Maximus himself. Um, he is well. You've got Russell Crowe. He's wearing that kind of breastplate. Yeah, and he's wearing that spiky helmet. Um, the I mean we we know they had we know they had helmets and everything else and stuff so much. It's probably more the breastplate part. So if you were actually wearing a a protection over, or if you were, if you had your chest covered, then actually chances were that you weren't an experienced fighter. You were actually considered a tunicatus, which is kind of like an amateur fight or a bit of a beginner. Huh. So when when kind of when 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 Maximus is going into the Colosseum, he's fighting that retired guy. And I, 
can't remember I can't remember a tired guy is wearing a cuirass as well. Basically, it wouldn't be a thing. It minimizes as well the kind of blood entertainment part. Yeah. You can cut bits of the back and you can cut parts of your flesh without damaging anything to still get the blood going and still and still bleeding. But basically, the only kind of armor, yeah. the most heavily armored gladiator were, were, were fighters like the Mamillo and the Secretor, and they had a big helmet on, they had that big shield, the Scutati, or the Scutum shield, and uh, some greaves on. But that was basically it. Oh, they might have had a manacle on as well on their, on their sword arm. Um, but that was basically it. Their chest would still be, would still be um, completely, completely open and exposed. Um, you would have the, uh, the, the only example to that would be the provocators, but only they had a, just a very small pectoral plate, and that, well, that was it. Uh, so probably everyone's wearing a bit too much armor, and probably thirdly is um, the uh, what, what, what were they going to say for the third bit? Um, just the fact that actually we don't have much evidence for mass fighting in terms of gladiators. If gladiators were going to fight, it seems that it was pure one-on-one -on -one duel. You never had if, if you had mass fighters, it was actually mostly. Uh, they would be just slaves, basically just just amateur fighters fighting each other. You might have had a couple of gladiators here and there, but the majority of them would have been just completely untrained fighters. So the times when the gladiators actually appeared was in this kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, dueling situation. So when you've got paintings like Jerome and you're, you're seeing depictions of multiple different gladiators fighting all at once, again, that's, that seems to be a complete myth as well. So, in summary, not necessarily the right weapons, not necessarily the right armor, and not the right context. And just yeah. because we have a little bit of time, um, surprisingly, <laughs> uh, you, you, you've just mentioned um, something about amateur fighters, but you've also been saying that a lot of these gladiators would have been actually trained professionals. So, was there like different levels or different types of games in which someone who maybe just came off the street could just grab a sword and sort of go in there and have a yeah, go? Or how, how does that work? So there seems to be, there does seem to be a kind of hierarchy in gladiator uh, schools. Um, and we have, we have evidence, we have direct evidence of them. It's what's called the palace system. Now, a palace is a state that would be put in the ground that everyone would train on. Um, and it seems that the system is kind of described as, as basically termed after this. Right. Um, it's a basic hierarchy and you would get the top people and, and it could actually be in a, in a single school, it could be split into a different types of gladiators. So you might have the palace system for the Thrakes, you might have the palace system for the Retiari and for the Secutors and, and whatever else. And the people at the top, maybe the people who are considered the best fighters, maybe they're the people who were who have been in it the longest or, or um, you know, have excelled at it the most. Um, but you do get these amateur fighters. As I said, like it could be if you were sentenced to death in the arena, it could be that you were then forced to fight in the arena. You may have no prior skill. You're not considered a gladiator by any means. You're just simply considered there as part of the punishment. You wouldn't feature as a gladiator. You'd be chucked in in kind of like the, the mass... Um, the mass uh, battle reenactment things where it was just designed to kill as many people, as many prisoners and slaves as possible. Um, but when you were when when you were training in a gladiator school, um, we know of one term called a tira, and it seems to be that a tira was a gladiator who hadn't yet had their first fight, their first proper fight in the arena. So they were still this kind of amateur. Uh, I talked about tunic artists. Again, it seems to be that people who were wearing the tunic uh, were more maybe these tier old people or people who were there in their first fight. Again, as a way of, of, of clearly differentiating themselves between the, the, the upcoming and the, the learning roles compared to like someone who would be maybe at the top of the palace system, like one of the best retiari that, 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 that would go in. So yeah, there, were, there, there, there does seem to be um, differing, differing clear levels in terms of where you were. And that, that kind of advocates for it being a sport, right? Yeah. Because if it wasn't something that was regulated, then it would be a free-for-all, I suspect. But if you actually yeah. have yeah. regulations and you know 
this guy is supposed to be this and be, you know, working in this way and that against this guy who's just a rookie, then I, yeah, I think it, that it, makes it, sense. Yeah, exactly. And um, um, the, the, again, going back to that, that law that, that came out under, under Hadrian, it was designed to set, uh, there, was, there, was another, sorry, there was another law that came out, it was designed to set the limit on what you could charge for a gladiator. And you had these different levels. And actually, we go up to about level, uh, I think it was almost like level five. I think it was from, from memory. And uh, it was effectively like, yeah, if you wanted to buy a level one gladiator, it'd be like about five, 5,000 sesterci or something. But level five gladiators could go for potentially something like 50, 60,000 sesterci each. That's a lot. For the limit. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was bankrupting. Um, people who had to put, there, there were like imperial cults of priests who had to put on shows as part of their role and they had to pay for it themselves wow. and it was bankrupting people so they had to bring in a limit because it was it was crippling uh, particularly in the east where the imperial cult was 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 most present it was just bankrupting wow. a lot of people so they had to put this limit on um, but there definitely seems to be a bit this this rental price of what you wanted so if you wanted some of the top gladiators uh, you could get them, and you know you'd be getting them, but you'd have to definitely pay for them. Yeah. It's like, so it's, it it's, it's, so in, that, in that sense, yeah, it's like when you kind of like, you, you're putting on a boxing fight, and you're hiring out, you, you want Mike Tyson to come fight, you're going to have to pay big money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, that's, that's fascinating, but I think it really kind of shows that this was just not, you know, for the sake of blood and gore, but there was actually, you know, a whole system behind it. And I think that's what a lot of people sort of are, are missing, but hopefully today they've, they've learned about this. Now, yes, no, it definitely, we have, yeah, it, 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 it definitely was. Oh, go on. We have two minutes to go. So before I give you more ammo to keep on talking, because I know you can carry on doing this forever. Um, is there one final sort of aspect about gladiators that you would like sort of really to home into people? just so they understand, you know, what, what the value on them is or what's the cool thing about them that is worth researching or looking out for rather than just necessarily Gladiator the movie? Like, why, why should people actually care about looking into these Gladiators from the right angle? Yeah. Yeah. So, again, to, the, the, what I wanted, what I try and get across to people is that Gladiators, it's not just two guys in the pit lopping each other's limbs off and, and one of them being killed brutally. It's way more uh, regulated or controlled than that. Uh, the gladiators themselves seem to look after each other. There are things in the in the games to try and help the gladiators. Uh, it's almost like a kind of boxing match. And we actually have evidence that there may be bouts, and in between the bouts, gladiators could actually have massages or have have water breaks okay. you'd have music you 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 potentially have music uh, music musicians in the in the arena as well provide music when they're fighting it's it's not just about the fighting it's this whole kind of there's a whole spectacle that goes on that goes on with it hence why it may a lot of it may be um uh, choreographed as well and why the gladiators were almost trained to instead of trying to dodge the blows just take them because it's way more exciting. It's kind of, again, like again, WWE, where you've got the two guys and they're just punching each other. They're not even trying to block it or whatever else. They're just having a complete like, slobber knock on each other. It's the same, it's the same thing there. Um, so it, 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 what I really try to get across to people is that there's, it's, it's, it's so much more, there's so much more to it than just two people fighting. Um, there's a whole spectacle theater part of it. And in fact, people will try and outdo themselves and how they did that spectacle, but it, you, people go through millions of sisters trying to do these games to, to help or have, to try and outdo each other. I think the second thing that I wanted, I want to um, try and get across is, is that what makes them really interesting as well is they're very reflective on our current society as well. We like violent games, we like violent movies. When, Hussa when, when Saddam Hussein got uh, hung and it got put on YouTube. Millions of views to see this guy hung, um, and it, a lot of it wasn't even out of any political um, desire or anything. They just thought, "Oh, someone's getting hung. I'll watch it." I admit, I did. 
it's, it's, that, it's that morbid fascination that, that we have. And it's, it's, it's this uncomfortable kind of truth for gladiators. There was a survey done, what one, one guy called um, Fagan, he did this survey in America, he basically said that if the American uh, penal system, if they were running, if they had, if they put on uh, fights to the death in their prisoners and that the winners could either get a reduced sentence or freedom, uh, would you watch it? And the vast majority of people said, yeah, yeah I probably would. Yeah. Even the people who sounded disgusted at it, who said like, I, I don't think I'd watch it long term, but I would probably turn in and tune in for the first one, yeah. And it's this sense of we, we live in, we, that we have an evolved form of gladiator fighting that, that doesn't get enough recognition. And basically we have our own modern day slaves, and I'm not talking about human trafficking or anything else. We have our new evolved slaves that are robots. And one of the, one of the new, and one of the main things that we're now doing with our robots is getting them to fight each other. We, we it's, it's almost as humans, like as soon as we can get uh, 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 some combat out of something, we're immediately gonna jump to it. So things like robot wars um, and, and you know movies about just giant robots hitting each other, like something like Pacific Rim or whatnot, um, we, we love it. And actually, and I, I could talk about this in, in greater depth, I know I'm running out of time, but do watch something like robot wars and consider them as as this as this new twenty first century cyber gladiator, and you may well realise that actually we're not any different than um, we, we, we're not on this kind of pedestal that we try to put ourselves on compared to Roman people. Um, you know, we, we 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 like to compare ourselves, we like to think we have honour and whatnot, like the ancients. But as soon as there's something violent and barbaric, like enjoying gladiator games we try and like push we try and like cherry pick bits from ancient culture and whatnot but when you when you watch something like uh, uh or even just even just like old school um ufc mma fights and whatnot but, but things like robot wars um we we we're, we're not really in any different makes sense so essentially humans haven't really changed that much since roman times <laughs> no, not at all. And in fact, there are gladiator fights going on in medieval times and all the way through history. So it's, it's always been a constant. Even when the Romans went Christian, there were still gladiator fights. But it's, it's essentially something in our human nature then. We just like to see yeah. people fight. Yeah, we and really the Romans see. found a way of sort of turning this into an unofficial sport that they could profit from. Uh, potentially and, and also exercise some social control right because if some of these people were potentially criminals or slaves whatever i think yeah 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 the idea was was yeah it was a kind of a lesson to people so if you saw someone who'd who'd committed a, a serious crime and all of a sudden he's getting his guts torn out by a leopard you're probably not going to want to do the same you're probably not going to want to do the same thing or if you do make damn sure that you don't get caught well that was part of, that was kind of the main, the main, the main lesson behind it. But there's, there's, there's ritual side, there's ritual parts of, of gladiator games. There's more sociological sides of it. There's even very kind of militaristic ethos side of gladiator. Games. So there's, there's, there's so much kind of, kind of um, going into it that, that um, it would definitely run over with this, with this thing. So <laughs> no, of course. I'd be more than happy to do another, to do another talk and go into a bit more in depth into. Um, kind of specific parts of it uh but yeah it it, it it it's so much more than just two guys um standing in a standing in the pit cutting the hell out of each other that's that's really sort of what i wanted to sort of finish this with it's it's not as you know simple as we make it be there is actually a lot of context and policies and politics and, and sociology that go into this type of fights and, and in general in the roman games it was not just for the sake of entertainment there was actually a lot more to it but like James said, yeah. this is a very long topic. We could go on about it for a really long time. But I think we've given you guys sort of a head start to sort of see why did these gladiators fights happen? How did they came about? What types of gladiators were there? And some myth busting about Gladiator, the movie itself. So hopefully you found that entertaining. And if you caught us towards the end, don't worry. This is being posted onto Instagram just now. And it will be at a later stage in YouTube. So you will be able to see this in full. But that's the end of the show today, guys. So thank you so much, James, for joining us. Um, as you all know, James has been doing lots of things with us. 
but gladiators is something that is really, really close to his heart and his focus of studies. So it's really, really nice that he actually gets to talk about this today. Um, so thank you, James. Um, any last words, please take the floor. Otherwise, this is the end of today. Cool. Um, yeah, no, just, just to, that, that's, if, if, if anyone's really interested in, in this kind of stuff, one of the best books that you can go out and read on it is by, um, it's by a guy called, guy called Fagan, and it's, it's called the, uh, the, the, the Lure of the Arena. Uh, and it looks at this kind of human psychological, it's quite groundbreaking in the sense of it's actually looking at this human psychology aspect of, of the games and why we find them so, so fascinating. But um, that was, that was um, it. but otherwise, yeah, like I said, it, it, there's so much to it. Or there's so much more to it. Um, I even put a couple of props there, but I didn't get to get to talk about. So my, my final, my final thing is just going to be just, you know, look at my sword. <laughs> so <cool. laughs> well there you go with that with that whole thing uh, about the sword and the book which is actually a really good book i've read some snippets of it so i can definitely also recommend it um you guys have a lot to go and explore and learn more about gladiators and oh yes no worries it, it will all go on instagram and on youtube later so you guys are very welcome to check it out and james is always happy to take questions so if any of you guys ever have any questions just drop him a message and he'll be able to answer it. And that's the end of today. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you've done it today or at a later stage. And see you very soon. Bye. Bye.